All right. How's everybody doing? Good? Uh, excited to get uh, get training camp going. Uh, the uh, I think, you know, as Steve said, this is the earliest we've ever opened training camp uh, here at Florida, but with the uh, early kickoff this year, I think I've had one this early before. I think a couple years ago, the NCAA allowed kind of with, with they're trying to tweak in the rules and gave you a little bit extra time where you could start training camp earlier. We were able to do that, which, you know, was kind of funny when they did that. It not, I don't know it had anything to do with starting early, but it had to do with a number of days. That was the training camp that the players thought uh, was the best training camp they ever had. It was the least number of injuries. It was the healthiest we ever were because we were able to give more days off. But with NSA rules right now, we uh, you know they kind of scrunch it all in there. So you got to really kind of scrunch it all in there. And you, they they they've decided to, for the players, I guess, to cut down on recovery time for the players by scrunching training camp uh, together with having the uh, the 25 practices in 29 days. Um, but. We are uh, getting ready to, uh, to go. Uh, like I said, this is the 150th year of, of college football, so it's a great honor for us to be involved in the game that kind of kicks off the 150th year of college football uh, and then to get to do it, you know, in a, in a game, in a, it, which is going to be a great environment down in, uh, down in Orlando at Camper World Stadium uh, and do it against two in-state rivals uh, that don't always get to play. So I, I don't think you could have a, a more exciting start to the season. Uh, but we got a long, long time before we even start thinking about getting to that. You know, our mindset right now, the big mindset for the team is changing uh, from offseason again back into the football mindset. We've talked about it uh, kind of the beginning of the week with our guys to start transitioning. Uh, their mindset from that, hey, I'm showing up to get a little bigger, faster, and stronger and get a great workout in, uh, to I'm showing up making sure that I'm learning the offense, defense, kicking schemes, uh, technique, having great technique, having great fundamentals. And I'm excited to get out there on the field and see the work that our guys have put in. You know, I mean, the, and when I talk about that work, it's not the work that they've put in with Coach Savage uh, and his staff. I know that works great. Uh, but it's all the, uh, you know, one of the big keys is all the extra work that our guys have put in, all the extra things they do on their own. And Summer may have the opportunity to go out there and throw, catch, work technique, fundamentals, you know, hit a sled. What, what extra, what more did they do on their own, uh, you know, watching film, put in the extra time to get ready for this season? So uh, hopefully it, uh, Hopefully they've put in a lot of extra time and they're prepared. They're ready to go and we get ready to uh, have a great training camp. Questions? Dan, obviously the offensive line is, I think, a big concern and everybody's talking about it. What if, will they be able to do it? I mean, when you look at it, the, the, the amount of time you were able to get those guys in, a, a play here, a play there, uh, how beneficial is that going to be for you? Well, I, I think huge. I, I think, you know, I, I, the concern, I don't know, it's the concern of uh, numbers. I think we're, you know, our depth is not great right now. You know, it, it, you get concerned in experience and depth. Uh, those are the two big things on offensive linemen. I think our guys have put in time. They've worked. Uh, I think we have some pretty good offensive linemen. They just haven't played a whole lot. And that's a position, obviously, where when you look, we get young really quick. And when you do that, when you have those depth concerns, you got to go stay healthy. So, uh, you know, they've they've put in a lot of work. One of the things how we set up training camp, a lot of guys get a lot of reps. Uh, I think one thing John always does is move guys around uh, so that you get used to playing with different guys. Uh, you know, and, and I know everybody gets, okay, who's running with the one uh, huddle or this guy's running with the one offensive line? Uh to me, we kind of rotate all that stuff on a daily basis. Some days this guy be with the ones. We put these guys in with the twos, Mitch and mix and match. Uh, obviously, we'd love to say, hey, these five guys were healthy and they played the whole season. We didn't have any any issues, and guys got really comfortable playing next to each other. And uh, but that doesn't always happen. So we got to have the guys get used to playing with different groups and different combinations on the line, and that gets experience. So we'll spend a lot of time with that uh, in training camp. Of getting those guys comfortable playing, you know, with different little different combinations up front and getting that experience and, and development and getting them ready to play. A little chilly. Yeah. Yep. Noah's, uh, you know, uh, he, he's got a, a couple other things he's still working on, but I know he wants to get back with the team. Uh, he's on our, our training camp roster. 
uh, to report to camp uh, when we report at five o'clock this afternoon. And, uh, I, I, you know, I mean, I, everything that I've been told we're on track that he's going to be set ready to practice tomorrow. We did, huh? Am I on IR? The, uh, I did, I passed concussion protocol, so I'm good to go. So I bumped my head and had to go. But they, they, they did the test on me, and I guess I passed, so they're going to let me practice tomorrow. <laughs> no, not I wasn't a guy. I just bumped my head into something. It wasn't a golf course injury. So I, I was able to stay healthy on the course this summer. Had a decent summer, too. I'm, catch, I'm trying to catch Coach Spurrier on my hole in ones. No, you got to yell. Uh, yeah, okay, here. So, so what, what's the toughest opponent you've uh, ever opened up with, and how does that kind of change your approach to camp? Well, as a head coach or in my coaching career? I mean, coaching career, head coach. Whatever. I think when I was at Notre Dame one year, we opened up with Nebraska. They were number one in the country in the preseason polls, and I think we lost, we lost that game in overtime, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so they were pretty good. Um, Oklahoma State, I saw Oklahoma you guys. Oklahoma State as head coach uh, at Mississippi State one year. I, I think one of it is uh, it, 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 what it can lead to is a little more sense of urgency during training camp. Uh, and I think the other that's a key component to it. And then the other component of, you know, as we talk at transitioning right now, we're transitioning from off-season mode mindset into football mindset. Uh, at the back end of training camp, you got to you got to transition from training camp mindset to game week mindset. Uh, you know the practices, everything you do is how you prepare the practices. What you're doing is completely different when you get in season than training camp. Uh, you know you're going from an install teach mode of learning the offense as a whole. Um, you know, you're going out to practice, you try to compartmentalize and install. But even scrimmage, you know, you're going to have, you know, you might have 175, you know, we got 195, 200 plays in, in training camp. When you get into game one, you're going to have 70 calls in that you're going to focus on against that specific opponent instead of all of our plays on offense against all of our plays on defense, all of our defensive calls against all the different formations we show. You hone it into kind of a game week game plan. So, um, it's accelerating that when you're playing a big time game one. Is you got to accelerate the transition period into game week. Where do you hope to see the most progress? I mean, offensive line seems like the given, but is there just a general kind of theme area you want to see the progress of the um, team? Offensively, obviously, offensive line is a big one where you want to see progress. Quarterback. Um, that I mean, to me, that's always the biggest one. You know, is is your progress at the quarterback position, especially coming back over the summer, because those are the guys that I want to see have developed and put a lot of extra work in over the summer uh, at that position. That you know, and that gets to the timing uh, of routes. You know, I say, hey boy, we should be able to go out there. I should be able to put a blindfold on you, and you know, tell you who the receiver is, and you can go throw that ten yard outcut. Um, type of deal, you know what I mean? And that, that's how in tune you are with those, the, with, with your receivers. Uh, but the, um, those are the big ones, obviously, you know, defensively, uh, defensive line, big one is making sure we're taking all the, the right steps with that, that unit coming together, uh, to play, play at the level we expect them to be. You know, I think line of scrimmage is huge for us where we take big steps forward. Uh, Dan, last year, team had such a chip on their shoulder trying to erase the memory of the 4-8 and eight season, try to prove mm -hmm. themselves to you. How do you think the increased expectations and familiarity with you will affect this team? Well, one, I hope the familiarity helps a lot, you know, that we're able to get things done faster, quicker, smoother, and progress at a much quicker rate because they know what to expect and know uh, what's about to come, you know, what, what are expectations of practice and what practice is like. And... Um, limits question marks. I certainly hope we still play with a chip on our shoulder. You know, I, I think we, I hope we have that chip on our shoulder. We look at last year and say, boy, there was a lot of great things happened last year. And there are a bunch of things that weren't great. Uh, and that you, you look at that and say, Hey, you know, there were, uh, there were, there were some things we needed to be a lot better at last year. And we have that chip on our shoulder to kind of, uh, get that back. You know, there were, uh, you know, in the three games that we didn't win last year, that we have a chip on our shoulder about those three games. because, And they were all three very different reasons to keep a chip on your shoulder. Of, 
you know, on our performance and how we did not perform uh, to our level of expectations in those games. And uh, so hopefully we keep that a little bit of a chip on our shoulder and a little bit of an edge to us as a team. Dan, I know you can't uh, really have that much communication with your players over the summer, but there seems to be among people a pervading spirit. There was a good deal of leadership shown, especially yeah. by six or seven guys. What stories have drifted back to you about the extra work, the extra days, the work ethic? Well, I, I think that I think the, the everything's got back to me. He's been been real positive with our guys. You know what I mean? And the positive of there's a couple aspects to it, which is the the team getting along. Uh, which is huge to me. And by getting along, the positive one are the things they do away from football together. You know, I, I think, you know, one of the great things, you know if you're going to have a successful team, when you get in and you see when the team's together, they do group activities. You know, whether it's, hey, we're all having a cookout pool party at someone's house when we have an, a, a day, an off day or at this apartment complex, which I know, you know, people are like, well, oh, boy, is that crazy or what? You know, sometimes you, you think of those terms, but there's positive for the team bonding, you know what I mean, and, and how they get along and how they get together and their, their desire to want to hang out with each other, uh, I think is huge. And I think, you know, you've seen that grow of the team growing co closer together that way. Um, then the other one, you know, I mean, to me is I think they know what our expectations and I think their comfort within the system makes it easier for them to do the extra work. You know, that when the quarterbacks and receivers go out, they know they know the offense now. They know the passing game and they've been through it all for a year. And so they know how to how hard they need to go work. And then you look at the guys and you have guys like a CJ Henderson, who's just such a hard worker. Uh, might not be the loudest, most vocal guy and a leader, but when you watch his work ethic is great, taking the young DBs and showing them little extra things, you know. Uh, yeah, he's always something jumps out every time you do a workout. Every When the workout's over, he's always working or practice over, working an extra technique and pulling young guys along with him. So I think um, that's real positive for us moving forward. Like yeah. on, on live TV, I, mean, I might look like nervous here today. <laughs> it is cold. I mean, it is flat cold in here right now. Like, well, this coach is like shaking up there. And like, it's fired up, ready to go. It was colder at SEC Media Day, so. Well, yeah, but I had a full suit. Yeah, because I, you got to like, I mean, a suit, I would have worn my big suit today <laughs> again if I knew it was going to be like this. Um, can you just talk about John Greenard and how you got him and um, how it exactly. The recruitment of him went. Yeah, I, I think one of the things is, is here's a guy that uh, he was in his last year at, at Louisville and, and got injured and wasn't able to play, you know. And I, I think it was a guy that, that had a great year and was uh, – I think some of it came to attention of, hey, he's graduating. Uh, he, was th he was graduating because he was thinking, I think, about, you know, possibly leaving early to go to the NFL if he had had a great season. Uh, being injured, I think, kind of got him to rethink that, set him back, uh, but was one of the kind of a, a fresh start. I think one of the big advantages we had in recruiting is uh, early, I think, as, as early in his career, he played for, for Coach Grantham at, at Louisville for a year, so he knew the system. He wasn't coming into a foreign system. He knew a system that he was actually recruited into um, to go play at and knew the system, so I think we were a great fit. Uh, and, and, you know, to be honest with you, I think in part of that mindset, it, and, and for me, that's something that's changing now over the last couple of years, which is the, not just the grad transfer, which he was, but the, just the transfer as a whole mindset, you know, with the portal and all the guys that are moving around and, and kind of the, the number of guys that are transferring, it, it gives you a different thought. You rethink how you view the transfers in college football. Uh, and I think if you just look, even looking at our roster and you look at rosters around the country, uh, I, you know, I, I want to say 10 years ago, you know, you're looking at a transfer and you're kind of like questioning him. Why is he leaving? You know, like what did he, did he get thrown out? Has he gotten in trouble? Uh, you know, what, what, what's the purpose of, of it? You know, I mean, what's the baggage that's coming along with a transfer? And I think in today's light, it's really changed. Guys are transferring because – the transfer portal is a much more common thing. So it's not kind of uh, – I, I think through a coach's eyes, it's really changed how you view transfers. So because, uh, you know, you look at our roster right now. I mean, you look at guys like, uh, you know, like Jonathan. You look at uh, Van and, and Trey Grimes and some of these other guys. You know, I'm, I know there's 
even a couple others on the, uh, you know, I mean, you got Schuler. Uh, I'm going to keep missing some, but there are even some even before I got here, right, that transferred in that are actually impact players, but it, not just on our roster. I think you look around the country and there's, it's a more, becoming more of a common thing. So it's changing your perspective on how you look at guys, how you view them, how you recruit them. So, you know, here is a guy that knew our system with Jonathan, get back to him, that knew our, that kind of was familiar within the system, that Todd had recruited into the system, uh, had been productive. You don't know how he's going to come back off the injury, but had been productive and especially in a huge need-based position where we had a guy that plays his position to clear early to go to the NFL draft, uh, you know, so that, that voided a roster spot within player development of somebody that you needed to come in and play right away. So that's kind of how it all, all got together. Hey, Dan, just to follow up on Noah Banks, since mm -hmm. he's kind of a big deal for a team that has you know, a bunch of first- and second-year guys otherwise and as far as depth goes, what can you sort of like reason, reasonably sort of expect from him? Because he's a guy who's missed so much time since – well, Last year, I guess. One of the things he and I sat down, and you know, and I think he knew we were we were 100% behind him, and so he went through all the spring, was really uncertain, and then you know he came and he came back 100% all in. I mean, he it was you know it wasn't, it, it was him saying I want to come back and play, uh, which was the mindset we needed to have. Then he's you know I think it got down to coach. Okay, I've missed a bunch of time. I got to get my, my, my body back right, ready to go play. And I said, well, you know, one of the things that, that we did a great job within the transition and making sure he's comfortable and said and say it, hey, I'm back with the team, is he did, he did uh, individual workouts, Coach, Coach Savage, uh, to get himself back in shape before he went back with the team and to make sure as working out, he was comfortable, ready to go back. And I think when he got back in shape with those individual workouts, started feeling really comfortable. He got back into the full team workouts and got ready to go. So, I, uh, you know, it is great for us to have him back. I know that one of the main reasons, and we recruited them, is looking at our roster and, and knowing that you're going to be in this situation, so he was going to be a critical part of the team, and, and getting him uh, healthy, being able to make sure he, that, that he's healthy to contribute uh, is, is huge for us. Uh, Dan, you've coached a lot of great offenses over the years. Uh, this wide receiver group getting a lot of hype going into the season. Uh, where do they rank for you, and what makes them special? Uh, well, you know what's really funny is, is it just shows how hard these guys have worked because this time last year with this same exact wide receiver crew, everybody's like, boy, this is like the big weakness of the team, and they're the worst ranked wide receiver group in the, the Southeastern Conference. And now year later, all the exact same guys are getting hype of being this big group. So uh, it just shows how hard would great Billy uh, Gonzalez done a great job with them coaching and how these guys have bought in and how hard they've worked, I guess, to get that hype. Uh, we've had some pretty good receiving cores uh, through the years uh, with some talented players. So we got to see how these guys go. The one thing I'm excited about it is, you know, that I think that that is pretty special is the depth that we bring. Uh, in, in that, that group. And I think the other thing that makes it great is uh, the confidence. When you have the depth and you have confidence in that group, you, you don't get into the point where you say, hey, you got two to three really special wide receivers that you're just trying to get those two or three guys the ball. When you have a depth and a group of talented guys that you have confidence in, uh, you can let the defense dictate who gets the ball. You know, you're not you, – we don't have to force feed the ball to certain people. We can let the quarterback go through his reads and take what the defense gives because we're pretty confident in every one of them being able to go make plays out there. So it, it, uh, um, it allows you to kind of run the offense more and the quarterbacks to run the offense and say, hey, if they're, they're going to give us this throw or give us this matchup, we feel great with that matchup. And if they're going to try to double this one guy, good, we feel great with this guy over here. And, you know, you're bracketing these two, we'll go to the third option. And uh, I, I think that, that makes life easier within running the offense. Matt, over here, and then Matt. Hey, hey, Dan. Hey. Yeah, they shut your mic off. They didn't like your question. Huh? Hey, Dan. Okay. Um, <laughs> We asked you. We have somebody in the back that can hit. Eh, eh, yeah. We don't want his question. That's all right. I don't, I don't blame <laughs> no him. No whammies. Stop. Don't blame him. Um, <laughs> we asked you in Hoover about how much harder it is to go from 10 wins to 11 or 12 yeah. compared to 4 to, to 10. What, as we sit here now, what gives you confidence that you guys can make that jump from here up to here? Well, I, I think the, the biggest one is the, you, you look at this roster and the fact uh, that they're in, in year two in the program, so they know kind of what to expect to come in. Um, 
I think we have some talented guys, but I also have I think we have some guys that can look at last season and have the maturity to look and say, hey, we had 10 wins, but we missed some opportunities last year where we could have been even better. Also, though, the maturity of saying, hey, we had 10 wins, and we, there were some, some games that, that, you know, we let get off a close that it could have been uh, – it could have very easily been an eight-win season last year, seven-win season. Uh, and I, so I think it's the getting that understanding of how small that margin for error is. And when you really understand that and understand how small the, the, the margin for error is, that's how you get those wins. That's why it is so difficult. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, you take a big leap from four wins. I think the, the guys obviously are disappointed with being, being on a four-win team. And you can take a big step and get up to four to eight is probably easier. But they can look and say, hey, that, that step from four to eight was probably not as difficult. But that eight got to 10 because of the, how we performed in these two games and the margin. It could have been really close to eight, but we found a way to get to 10. But that 10 also could have been 12 by about that much too. Um, you know, in the little things in our approach and our mindset and our attitude and how we handled different games. And so I think that maturity uh, within the team gives you the opportunity to go do that. Dan, you got you got a couple guys wearing the number one this year, and I think you've talked about that ballers type thing. Yeah. What what do those guys do to to separate <laughs> themselves and and earn that? Well, I, I think the one thing to me is you know you want the 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 one of the most the time consuming, annoying jobs of the head coach is jersey numbers, right? We have two wearing number one. If, if I open it up, we might have up to seven to eight do it. One of the things I, I want to petition the NSA to is go back to the old days where you can be number one, but you can be 01, right? So we have single digits. Like there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then there's 01, 02, 03. And so I can have twice as many guys have the one through nine jersey distinction, I guess. Uh, but uh, no, those both those guys... Uh, to me, they came, asked for it. You know, I, I, I love to reward guys doing things kind of the right way. You know, and you look at it, uh, CJ came and asked me, and obviously CJ's a guy that's done everything we've asked him to do. Does a great job within, you know, leadership. I know he's not vocal, but in his actions, does a good job in leadership, does a good job going to class, taking care of his business, doing things the right way, and he's performed at an extremely high level on the field. Uh, and the same thing with KT. Everything, you know, we've asked him to do, he does and has performed at a high level on the field, right? I mean, I don't know, someone, what he averaged nine yards every time he touched the ball last year? Is that what it was? 11? Huh? 10.9. I thought it was nine. I was going to say, so if once every three plays we gave him the ball, if it was nine, we only had to get one yard on the other two plays to get a first down. So if I was a smarter coach, but I guess, anytime we need a first down, we give him the ball. In theory, we should get a first down then. Uh, <laughs> huh? Yeah, we might. Yeah, well, it's exciting things happen. But, uh, but those two guys did it. And, you know, one of the things I love to do with the players is put them – I, if you do well, I want to reward you. You know, I always tell guys that. You know, hey, if, if you're getting bad grades in school, you're getting trouble, you're missing workouts, you're not doing things the right way, you know, I'm give you jersey number 43 and put some high tops on you and, you know, I mean, like a dual bar face mask. Right? I mean, I don't know. I mean, disrespecting number 43, which I don't intend to do. But, um, you know, but, the, uh, but I think the guys that do the right thing, you love to reward them. And they, they view that as a great reward and something that they want to do. So I don't, I don't mind it. You know, I, I hate the hardest one for me is the game management with multiple guys in the same jersey. You know, and it, when it's offense, defense, you don't think about it as a big deal. But when it gets to special teams, that's when it becomes – really kind of a, a pain for us. And then to, keeping on the Tony thing, do you have, you just talked about not having to worry about touches, but do you have a number in mind that you feel like you, you need to get him the ball? No, I, you know what? I, I think one of the things we spend time on is making sure, you know, you have to get it two plays. And I think, you know, in year one, you're kind of learning everybody. But I think in year two, you have a better understanding of players and guys that have earned the right to have get it two plays. Hey, you know, I mean, whether you, if you're a guy on our team, we want to make sure we have enough in our offense to get you the ball, 
uh, not just him, but other guys. I don't think we put a set number on touches, but we certainly want to carry enough, get it to plays where, hey, uh, like I said, there's within our, our players, especially at the receiver position, without worrying who's getting the ball, you know, like letting the defense, we're going to take what they give us. But there's also guys we want to make sure we get them into the game and touch the ball so that we have get it to plays to make sure these guys are getting their touches if the defense is trying to take someone away from you. Yeah, yeah, we have a get it to section on the play call. So we have it like, hey, here's the get it to plays. And, and a lot of times what Mike do is it's a get it to position. You know, hey, we're calling this play is going to get the ball to the X or the Z or the H. And then the nice thing having veteran receivers, they all know that position. So if, if somebody's like, I'm kind of not been part of the game, I'm like, hey, get in. It's, you know, you go play Z this play and we're going to get you the ball. And it gets, keep, can keep everybody into the flow of the game. There are a lot of talk about the offensive line uh, and the re receiver group, but the tight end is such an important uh, position in, in your offense. You lose a couple guys last year. Bunch. Where where are the tight ends? Uh, you, it's a deep group, but not not totally experienced. It, they're, they're, it's very similar to the offensive line. I think the one hard thing, you know, Lucas missing a bunch of spring. Uh, you know, again with the. <laughs> I love some some of the rules. We look at some of the, the rules that they put out. Well, this rule's in place for player safety, and he gets hurt because of the rule because you can't have any, you know, you can't even put a spider pad on him. Like, they can't have zero pads, and a kid falls and gets hurt because they're running around pretty fast going full speed. So, uh, you know, the, we end up suffering more injuries for the NSA rules that they try to put in to prevent injuries and it puts kids in more danger. Uh, but the um, – for a guy like him getting back, he's put in a bunch of extra work in all the meetings and knowledge in the position to know. I, I think Larry does a really good job with those guys. Like I said, we have a bunch of tight ends. Uh, you know, when you look at, uh, at that depth, and we have guys that play. You know, the great thing was to get Lucas to play last year. You know, when, when he came out of junior college as a, a, a three for three instead of a three for two, where if, if three for two, you might think, I really want to redshirt this guy last year. So he has two great years having that year where he was able to get in games and get some experience that he's played. Kyle Pitts has played uh, a bunch. Uh, Kamori's gotten in games and played. Uh, now, they haven't been the guy, but they've been in games. So, you know, it is a big position for us for those guys to have to really take that next step forward to become the guy uh, in games. You know, and then you look at, you know, with, with Zip and, and um, Dante, some of the younger guys, Saldivar, you know, as a walk-on, had a great spring for us. There, there is some depth at that position. Guys have some game experience, but not that experience as being the every down guy. And that's really what you want to see, that confidence that they can do that. Do you have an expectation for that group? Or you kind of wait and see and see how far? I want to see how they continue here. to grow. You know, and, and see how they continue to develop. I mean, I have we have high expectations because it's such a critical part of our our team and uh, in, within our scheme of creating mismatches on the field. And when you look at the talent potential all those guys have, you, you feel excited about it. But we need to see them go take that talent potential and, and uh, translate it into performance. You've mentioned depth a few times for some positions, but how do you feel like overall depth? behind the ones uh we're getting there you know uh we're getting there I think that's you know when, when you you come in and I think the biggest one of us in taking the program over is that that is creating that depth you know uh sorry you always have you know you have a always a little bit of attrition when you take over a new program of guys that came and this you know I came to play in a different maybe style offense the program was different a little bit when I came so there's there's there is a, always sometimes a little bit of attrition uh, that you get into I think uh, the new norm in college football which is going to be really interesting with the transfer portal is is depth will be an issue for a lot of people uh, moving forward I think until everybody gets into the adjustment of it and uh but overall I, I think our depth is good I don't think it's great yet but I think we're going to get there within the next you know hopefully within the next two to three years we get where we feel really comfortable with our depth what, top to bottom what, what are some of the more intriguing position battles you think or is that something that maybe fans and media focus on more than coaches I, I, I think I think it is I think it's what you said. I think a lot more people focus on it because mine is not really a position battle as far as a, it's, a, it's always a rep battle, you know, of how many reps have you earned to play. You know, I don't 
I don't like guys playing 70 plays, plays in a game. Uh, you know, I mean, it wears you down. I mean, you're going to be obviously – if the more players we can rotate through, the fresher and healthier we stay throughout the long part of the – you know, throughout the season as a, as a whole. Uh, so our, my battles are all how many guys do we have that have earned rights to go play. You know, it's a, I mean, it's heck of a deal if you're three deep at a position. Hey, that means everybody's got to play, you know what, maybe, you know, 25 to maybe, maybe 20, somebody gets 25 to 30 plays in a game is a lot, you know, maybe 30, you know, especially guys that are, that are special team or core guys. Cause now, hey, you get, you're three deep at a position. Guys are getting 35 plays in a game, including, or 40 plays in a game, including offense or defense and special teams. Those are guys who are going to be pretty healthy and fresh throughout the course of the season and throughout the long haul of the season. So I think it's a lot more that way for me than I, – I don't like I don't view it as, okay, this guy's the starter, this guy's the backup. I view it as but I, I, how many starters can we have? You know, ideally you'd love to have at least, you know, 25 starters on offense and 25 starters on defense, and they, they, you can roll those 25 guys through and be comfortable. I don't know if we'll get there. But that's where I want to have a, a guys that you feel comfortable being starters. How hard is it to get players to buy into that philosophy? Uh, you know what? It, it, the great thing is, I think when guys start to do it and see success that they're having, I, I think they understand it. You know what I mean? And I think when, if you even look at last year, where you look at, hey, a, a Jakai Polite, who was, uh, I, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many games, whether he started how many games or not, but he was in that role as, as a, a rotating player and ends up being a, a, a draft pick. And a, a Jordan Scarlett, who buys into that philosophy, goes on and is an NFL draft pick. And a P. Ryan, who buys into that philosophy and has a lot of success. And uh, So I think uh, when you see the guys that really buy into, you know, that when the easiest thing is I think guys saw immediate success with it and the older guys believe in it. And so the younger guys – follow older guys. Hey, I want to be like him. You know, younger guys come into the program. I want to be like this guy. And, you know, and that guy's telling them, Hey, this is how you can be the most successful. And, uh, it, it gets it to be an easier buy-in. Anything new with the three freshmen who are still trying to get into class? Wilson, Henderson, Marks. Yeah. Marks is reported to training camp. Um, Wilson is, I mean, that's, that's, that's not a surprise for us of that situation. We, you know, we, I think we had a lot of the information on it, and we knew that that was going to be a process that we would not know a calendar or a timing on the process. And uh, to be honest, with you, our expectations were it, it, it would happen at some time, but it wasn't. We weren't, you know, thinking it would happen immediately. Uh, Henderson's finishing up. He'll be here this weekend, and he has. Uh, you know, he has a, a things to finish up just because of where his school calendar was. And, Dan, anybody limited with the injuries to open camp or out of uh, limited? Obviously, David Reese, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, had, had the injury where he'll miss, miss the season. And, uh, you know, one of the great deals about the new NCAA rule is, I mean, he'd be on the edge, could possibly be on the edge for a bowl game. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it'd be really I, I, that that could be pushing it. But what a great motivating factor that you know he wouldn't lose. He, you know, he could he could save a year because of injury and still have the opportunity and, and motivating to get himself healthy back to even play in a bowl game, which would be fantastic. Uh, you know, a couple other guys have some little small tweaks that might limit them, but not that or, you know uh, that we expect to have anything that would extend through the end of training camp. You know, there'd be guys with some limitations that were still coming back off of an injury. I think, you know, if a guy sprained his ankle last week, that might be, you know, slowed down, but nothing that would limit the extended training camp. But everybody else we feel uh, ready to go. Dan, you were reasonably vocal last year that you weren't sure you had players that kind of knew how to lead. I think mm -hmm. you talked about CJ a little bit, but how different do you feel this year in terms of the guys? Uh, I think we'll be better. Because I, I think one of the things that helps with leadership now is when you know what's going on. You know, so it, when, when you know what practice is going to be like, you know what training camp is going to be like, you know what a game week routine is. When you know all of those things as a player, it's easier for you to step up as a leader because you're not trying to figure out what's going to happen. So I think there's going to be a lot more comfort with guys that are in the program. Uh, and there's, you know, when you look at guys like a CJ that everyone looks to, knows is a great player. 
Uh, and then he knows that, hey, when he speaks, it, the team's going to respond to what he has to say. You know, Felipe now that has gone and played a bunch, when he speaks, the team's – like all our quarterbacks, I think our guys, even all of them, uh, you know, when you look at all three of the guys, that they've played in games – that they've everyone's seen the work that they've put out. That when those guys speak and they know the routine, they know the offense now, it's a little bit easier to lead. You know, the wideouts, especially you got a veteran group of wideouts that they know that they've put in play, made plays, they know the offense, know what to expect. It's easier to step out front and be a leader. Yeah, uh, a little bit more specific on depth with some of the departures this summer. Where's your comfort level at with the corner depth? Uh, it's okay. You know, obviously with anything, that's part of when we get to is staying healthy. You know, if we stay healthy, I feel really comfortable with it. You know, what, what hurts is when you start having injuries, uh, that starts to become an issue. And, you know, now you got to move guys around in the secondary. One of the big things to me in the secondary I always like is guys that have position flexibility back there. You know, you look at a trade dean. You know, when you go recruit a guy that can play corner, can play nickel, possibly can play safety if we needed him to. When you have guys in the secondary that can play, you know, we have really our five secondary spots, six if we get into dime, but really the five that you use. When you have guys that have position flexibility, uh, it allows you to deal with depth issues if you need to. Um, but obviously, you know, if we, if we do that, then we're going to have to start moving people and then we can't rotate as much. If we stay healthy, I feel okay with it. And then LaMichael P. Ryan said that he would know what this team is going to be this season by the end of fall camp. When is that clear for you? And, and what is it that stands out that kind of lets you know? I, I would think, I, I think, uh, well, there's going to be a lot of different things that happen during the season, but I think we'll have an, I think we'll have a, be, a much better idea of the type of team we're going to be sooner this year than we were last year because it was all a feeling out process. So I think we'll have a good idea what type of team we're going to be at the end of fall camp. But then also, you know, during the course of the year, I mean, we're going to have to deal with different adversities during the season and that we're not going to be, have to deal with in training camp. You know, the one, you know, I mean, you have the, the adversity of success, uh, how we're handling that, uh, the adversity of failure, how we handle that. At times last year, we didn't handle either of those two things very well. Uh, at times we did. And so it's going to be how this team responds to that. When good things happen to us, can we keep the chip on our shoulder and the grind mentality to continue to work harder to get better? When bad things happen to us, can we focus on – getting back to work and making the things that we need to do to be better. Uh, and do we have the, 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 you know, that belief in ourselves that we can be a great team? You know, we get put in a situation in the big game where we got to go make a play to win. Do we have the confidence and we expect to do that? You know, and as, as our guy said, you know, the margins like that, the margin gets really tiny. And do we have that mental toughness to handle the success, the mental toughness to handle if the, the, you know, the failure of things going bad and the mental toughness to finish and the confidence in ourselves to make plays and, and to think that we can be a championship team. Dan, back to the left. Coach. Uh, Coach, you obviously have a knack for calling ball plays. I was just curious, could you take us through a little bit of when you're on the field, some of the things that are going through your mind as, as you begin a series? Yeah, well, one of the things we do is, is it, we're pretty fortunate to have guys that have been around each other for a long time. Uh, you know, and, you know, as we get into a series, we kind of look at things we want to do, and you're always trying to look three to four moves ahead. Mm -hmm. So here's, you know, we, you kind of have some of those pocket plays, okay, that here, here's things that we feel good about going into this series. And then as a play caller, you have the pocket one. So, if, okay, if these things are going well, we've set them up for this. If these things are going well, we've set them up for this. If these things are going well, we've set them up for this. Uh, and that's where... I think we have had success is here's the things we want to do to set them up and let's see what happens well. And then we're going to at the right time call the play that we've set them up for. Uh, the benefit also that we have is a, I think a, a coaching staff, really good coaching staff offensively that have been around where guys aren't afraid to make inputs. You know, when, Hey, we have them set up for this play. I'm not always the one that calls them. 
You know, I mean, you know, we go back. I remember, I think, the, the bowl game. Like, you know, we hey, on fourth and one, and we run the jet sweep to Kadarius Tony. That was Brian Johnson called that play. You know, or uh, and John Hevesy and Billy Gonzalez will call plays. And they'll say, hey, hey, I think we have, you know, we have them set up for this right now. Great. Call it. And they'll let, uh, they'll let me know that. Uh, and I think it's the confidence those guys have and how we've worked together and their ability. You know, I think we have – I mean, I think we have five guys on our offensive staff that would be pretty comfortable calling the game. And when you have that and when you have, have those guys that have worked together and know the, know the offense that well um, and that are, are, are comfortable around each other, it's really easy to make those inputs, not just between series with what we're going to call, but in the middle of a series, if they think we have something, they're, they're going to step up and say, we should run this right now. Um, and I think that, that, that helps us uh, within our play calling. How do you manage that with the with the play clock play clock going on in the game with five different guys, or, or is it just your you know what it, it, it is? It, it, I think it's the confidence. You know, I mean, like I said, like if like if I'm in the game and Brian's like run this now, I'm like call it. So it's not like I'm trying to find the caller. One like he knows, hey, let's run this right now. I'm like call it. So he knows it was in his mind what we should run at that moment, mm -hmm. and I just shut my mouth and he calls the play to signal it in, and that's kind of how we do it, which is. Uh, I think in, in managing with the play clock, like you said, it's the confidence in me and the coaching staff and each other when someone does that. Uh, I mean, I, I just call it. That's, uh, you'll hear me. Just call it. And then he'll call the play, and they signal it in instead of me trying to – him say, let's do this. Okay, let me find it. Let me try to call it. I'm like, call it. Call the play you want to run right now. And they call it and get signaled in. And uh, – you know, I might trump it sometimes. I'll say, no, I want to run this, and I just call it. But I think that how fast all that happens helps us out a lot. Uh, the transfer portal has been a big talk um, all off season, but um, especially quarterbacks. What does it say about a guy like Kyle Trask, who's who stayed here, and even though he hasn't had a chance to start, um, has honored his commitment and, and continues to work? I think it says a lot about and not just him, but all our quarterbacks. You know, if you look at – I saw something about where – like, right, I mean, 75, like Felipe in the class that he was in, right? I think Kyle, is Kyle the same? They're the same class. They're the same class, right? But, like, of the top quarterbacks in that class, like 75% have already transferred, and those both those guys are sticking it out doing it. But they're also looking at the success they've had, you know, and, and how they're being developed um, and what they're able to do and by buying in and buying in long term. And even Emory Jones, his class, there's been a bunch of transfers already. And of sticking it out and understanding, okay, there's a process to my development. That's one of the things I share with quarterbacks. I, I, I think if you look and everyone's like, but, you know, when I talk to Coach, I've, you've done a great job of developing quarterbacks. You know, I hear that a whole bunch. Um, but I've also done a great job of developing quarterbacks. And, but you don't always see all of them have huge success in year one uh, within the program. You know, there's there's a development pattern to those guys. And those guys, I think, have really bought in and understood, like, hey, if I buy in under this program, uh, you know, coach does a great job of developing quarterbacks, but it's not, you know, I like everybody, like I, like I was joking, like the magic dust, I'm going to sprinkle it on you. You just come play for me. I don't sprinkle dust on you, become a great quarterback. There's a, there's a process in developing you. Um, and that takes time. And these guys, I think, understand and say, hey, if I buy into this program, I'm going to be developed to become a great quarterback. And so it shows a lot of their – under one, their maturity, um, but also their character and, and wanting to become better, understanding we're going to get them better, and their character of wanting to be part of a program and, and, and being all in to what we're trying to do, it, it shows a lot from them. Dan, as we sit here today, there's a lot we don't know about your team, and you don't know about your team. It's going to be interesting to find out what it is. But there are some boxes you could check if you really needed to. Like if I said physical conditioning, yeah, up, I'm, right? I'm not. I'm probably not worried about that. Yeah, I, right. I, I trust Coach Savage got him ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> so quarterback position, more experience, playing better, et cetera. Are there other boxes you can check right now on things like that that you feel pretty confident will be a part of what um, this team does? I think – well, I mean, the biggest one to me is I, I think that you can check is that we know the players better this year than we did last year. I think if there's one big one is I, you know the personalities of the guy and what you're dealing with. You know what buttons that you can push. And you know when at practice what I see from somebody 
and how they've translated that to games and where they need to improve. And, and I think if there's a biggest box to check for me, it is us knowing each other a little bit better. So, hey, I've seen, I've, you know, like, hey, I've seen this before of how you practice, but that didn't translate into a game, so that's not good enough anymore. I need, this is what I need to see from you. And I think that's probably the biggest box is us knowing uh, a lot more about the players uh, that I feel comfortable with and knowing that the players know what to expect from the practice field. And if I'm not getting that, then we have a problem because there, there, there's not, there shouldn't be a question. There should be right from day one, from the first period of the first practice, they know, they know what our practices should look like. So those boxes should be checked, and those are the two biggest ones. How about the one on leadership? Is that a big box, uh, Chip? We'll see. We'll see when we get out there. Because to me, I'm, I'm not concerned. Like, I think our leadership and, and everything I hear is positive, but so much as the leadership is what have they done away from us? I think the leadership box has been checked in the summer when they're working out with Coach Savage. Uh, we ask them to take care of their business. I want to see was the leadership there for them putting in the work they needed to put in on their own when nobody's around. It's just the players. And we'll see. I, I, that, that'll be a couple, that'll be a, two weeks until I see whether that actually happened or not. You know, everyone, I know after practice one, I'll be like, hey, did you see it? I won't see it in practice one. I'll know it in a couple of weeks. Thank you, guys.
This is like that. my wife was watching some game show with that long thing. Alec Baldwin, the old school microphones. How's everyone doing? What do you got? What do you got? What do I got? Hey, I'm looking forward to the season. New season, I mean, obviously, he's coming the second year. Um, looking forward, I mean, looking forward to uh, the excitement of the team, the excitement of the fans, the excitement of the whole university. Uh, obviously, we start the season off early in the 24th with Miami, which is a you know, obviously a big game to start with and different than starting with, I hate saying a lesser opponent, but just someone different than um, the, the, per se the warm-up game. So for us, I'm, to me, I'm excited about it. I'm excited that um, I'll have four new starters. So it's, it's for me, uh, you know, as many years you do it, uh, you're walking in. And to me, last year was a lot of obviously returning starters, but just different. I mean, learning, everybody's learning everything new. So this year is going to be a little different. Obviously, they, they know the system. Now it's just kids that haven't really started to have a lot of starts under their belt. So it's going to be a great opportunity for, for you know me to challenge. It's been a challenge since, obviously, um, whatever it was, January, whatever, after last year, that knowing that you're going to be replacing four starters uh, to get start getting them ready back in January up until we get ready for August 24th. Is there one position that keeps you awake at night? Uh, the five of them. Left tackle, the right tackle, straight across. No, I mean, there's not, because I, I think to me, obviously, walking out of spring practice, I felt good with the first five. Um, I think they still, I mean, Noah Banks wasn't there in the spring, but Noah's back, so that it'll be good to have him back because he has some experience. Chris has some experience, you know, and Richard Garage has some experience from last year with the, um, I think the greatest thing they did was changing that rule to play in four games. Um, so it got them a chance even to play in a, whether it was four or five snaps in the bowl game. To just get in a bowl game to experience that type of stuff, experience a little bit of the Florida State game. Um, so I think you, you have the opportunity. That's a big help than it was kid never seeing that me walking out there with Chris, Richard, and going, they've never stepped on the field, they've never seen the field, that what's going to happen that first time. So I think the, the good thing is they've been on the field with, I hate to say it's a lot of experience, but at least the, the shock of running out in that field from the sidelines for the first time, which over the years you, uh, you know, some of the great stories, kid, about six years ago, he knew he was a backup. Redshirt freshman knew he was a backup. He all, I mean, all spring, all camp, knew he was a backup. The third play of the LSU game, kid goes down with an ACL, and I turn around and I said, go. And he said, me? I said, yeah, you. He goes, right now? <laughs> yeah, you got to play. So I think for, for those kids, it's easier now. Again, I have five true freshmen that are here that were here in the spring, four of them are in the spring. Um, that's going to be that for them when they got to go in the game for that first time. Uh, but to me, you know, being in the stadium and scrimmage in the stadium, the spring game, you, you try to give that a little bit of experience of running out there by yourself with a crowd and, and with whatever it is, 20, 30, 40,000 people in the stands. So they got a little bit of that. Does Nick have to be a leader 
Has to be. I mean, the center is always going to be, for me, has always been and always will be. Um, he's my quarterback. He's going to, again, he's the center of the whole thing. So he has to, he's going to direct both sides. You know, he's got to keep both sides on the same page. And I think and Nick's a very bright kid, and Nick picked it up extremely well last year, which put him in that position of picking up the offense, picking up the terminology, uh, accepting what I challenged him to to do, and he did it. And I think that's helping these kids, obviously, through the spring. And, and he's done a great job in the offseason, not just with that part of it, but just with he's been around here five years. Didn't have a lot of playing time early on, but he's jumped into it, and he really embraced it. And you see him even, you know, we walked out of meetings the other day, and, and the time limits we have, we walked out of meetings after 45 minutes. And then, you know, we had to go up to a staff meeting. It came back down, I think it was probably 45 minutes later. They're all walking out of the meeting room. And I said, and first question is, what are you guys doing? You know, but Nick was just like, oh, you know, a couple of young guys wanted to go through the, the installation, get ready for camp. So we just stayed in there and kind of probably gave them their terms. You know, here's the, when I teach you, here's what I say. Well, they're going to give you a little different way, maybe teenager to teenager, 18 year old to 18 year old to explain it to them. So the verbiage will help those kids. But just watching that leadership role of really him, Brett uh, and Stone are, are the three that to me have really done a great job leading those, helping those young kids. Because there's a lot of them. There's eight of them that are running around that, don't have a lot of playing experience. What kind of relief is that for, for you as a coach? What kind of what? Relief is that to have that kind of leader? I guess it relieves you because you have that, but there's still four that <laughs> he's got to make sure he's got them. But it is. It, it, and it's, I think our success has always been it has been based on the center over all the years. You know, who, you know, and not as it, not that has to be a great player. I mean, you can go back to 2006. I wouldn't say Steve Rissler was the, the, the great, but never played it down in the NFL but was a great communicator, a great leader, and everyone listened to him, and he set everyone straight. So to me, you, you go back and you win a championship, and who was the center? Steve Rissler. I mean, how many people in this room knew that to this point? Now, they'll remember Marquise Pouncey after. But Steve Rissler was the, the center of the national championship year, which he did a great job communicating and getting them all on the same page and, and were functioning as one instead of five. And I think that's a huge deal. For, that's a huge deal for me, and it, it keeps everyone, again, because that side's not going to hear that side. He has to communicate between left and right. Uh, I, I don't know if it's his physical. I think it's just his confidence with him, you know, trusting that and something that he hadn't had to do, that all of a sudden he realizes he's a better player. It's building him confidence and it's getting him more of the things he wants. I mean, an all-around player, not just a one-dimensional player, but A, and it's going to help us win games. Him not having to, you know, we're not asking, we're going to ask him to run 25 times a game. But to me, those, maybe it's four, five, six times a game that, hey, we're going to ask you to go third and one. Hey, the, the, the bowl game. Listen, get the right check, and you run yourself for a 40-yard play. Pull one of the runs, and you, you're selling a 50-yard play. And for him, again, like any kid, I think it's, it's exciting for him to realize I'm making big plays, not just with my arm, with my body. And, his, and he's as talented a kid as I've ever been around ever in college football, that he's utilizing everything he has. Does that change anything for your linemen, though, when you've got a guy that can do that? Yeah, I think, I mean, any time, when you watch, you know, whether it was Jordan, Jordan last year and LaMichael and Pierce, when you have guys in the run game, when you have guys putting in that hard work and they're taking the contact and they're getting those yards after contact, it's for me putting to them and them understanding they're working hard. We got to work harder. And not just from the I mean, helping the start, but then as, as they're going forward, listen, get over there and push that pile for two, three more yards because they're working. Don't stand around and watch. What's the biggest factor in making this year's offensive line successful? I think it's just play, I mean, playing as one. Them again, Nick's got to start it with the communication of it, but them understanding and them having confidence in themselves. You know, because it'll be between Stone and um, I think Stone's the one that's been there. Stone and Brett Heggie have been on Brett played two years ago, um, but Stone has, has played sparingly over his time here. Is the biggest thing I think with all these guys is just confidence in themselves. You know, have confidence in yourself and then learn to communicate as a group. And once you get the confidence in yourself, again, I have the confidence, we're putting you out there. We have the confidence you're going to play. Just make sure you have it in yourself. And guess what? You're going to have a bad play. Something stupid's going to happen. Okay, have, have quick amnesia in that thing and get back to the next play. Don't worry about it. You can't dwell on the past. Move to the, you know, and that's going to be with the young guys. That's always the thing. They're, they're worrying about what they did. Great. You, you screwed it up. Okay, you had a great play. Don't get too high. Don't get too low. Just keep playing next play. Keep working. You know, in the spring, I kind of keep them the same side just so they're going the same way, so they're learning, so I give them a chance to learn it. So they learn the scheme. Now, as we go, and I've always done, is going to be you have your, your first five. And really, after that, is get eight ready 
which to me it's going to be a, a cross training of that backup tackle is going to be possibly left or right. Okay, the guards left or right. And then obviously, I mean, the center position is a center position, but then it's also from that point on is, uh, you know, looking at this year, the guys that have how it steps up because there's young guys, the true freshmen that are involved, start getting involved in too deep. It might be, uh, you know, the sixth and seventh guy are right guard, right tackle, left guard, left tackle. So if it's, a, if it's Richard Garage is the backup left tackle, but if something happens, he goes in at left guard or left tackle. So just to me, it, I'll look, that, look at that more as we get through camp, as we see through camp, how they're going to rotate, who is, you know, well, they become a starter, they become a starter too. You know, no, the depth chart's the depth chart to start. We've got to go out there at ones, twos, and threes. But to me, they know the first thing is go win the job. You're going to win the job now and get ready for August 24th. What's that? Yeah, I, I tell Nick every day, you know, listen, <laughs> there's guys behind you. I mean, you got to keep doing your job and what you're supposed to do. To me, does he have, like I tell, I, every walk into meetings is, listen, guys are one, twos, and threes. Nick, you started a year. Brett, you started two years ago. Okay, so you have a head start. No, that doesn't mean sit back and, oh, I got my job. I say, again, I tell the young guys, I don't care that he's a fifth-year senior and he started last year. Your job is to take his job. No different than last year coming here with, with Nick was sitting there going, well, I've never really played. Okay, so okay, then why don't you leave? I say, if you, don't think, if you don't think you can play, then you don't need to be if you're not going to compete. So everything to me is competition. So to me, A, we've got to get better by the guys behind him, whether it's Tanner, whether it's um, Kingsley pushing him, okay, or whoever it's going to be. If there's someone else that there's five better and someone's going to take his job, then take it. I said, but it's only going to make us better as a team, and it's going to make you better as an individual and make us better as a group. I think the biggest thing coming in last year, coming between January and spring practice, was just not knowing anything about any of them, whether it was besides who had played, who I'd watched on film, but to me, who they are in the weight room, who they are as leaders, who they are as when they're, you see, you go through the weight, you go through the weight room in January, February, you go through the off season program uh, with Nick in terms of the, who's pushing, who's leading, who's working. Okay, so you kind of get a glimpse of who they are. You don't really, you see some of the talent part of it, but you see, okay, who are these? These are the guys that push themselves and work. Okay, so at least I have that in my mind going to spring practice. And then it comes to, again, who's, who's changing the offense, changing technique of what was taught to them, who's buying into it, who's learning it. You know, and then if certain things happen, like Hagee hey, wasn't there for the spring, so it, it gives an opportunity for more guy to come up. TJ McCoy got injured, I think, early on in, in spring practice, so it's okay, guess what, go. I mean, Nick, you're going. And then to me, as you went through spring practice, was they all had reps. So when you evaluate who graded out in the spring, it's okay, here's one, two, and three. Then you go in fall camp, it's still open again. That to me through fall camp, I kind of rotated them all with even Nick Villano when he was there was, okay, you three, you're only going to shot with the ones because I don't know who can play. Who's the best one of the three? So we're going to keep giving competition through the whole thing. And then as camp went on, you know, a guy gets dinged up. You don't lose your job, but someone else gets, a, gets ahead of you farther. And that's what kind of Nick did. TJ got banged up, I think, here and there. And then Nick kept going. And then when Charlie came back, it's Nick kind of, he, he held his job. And to me, again, I think the biggest thing he did was starting this, the conversation off was he did an unbelievable job leading and speaking and communicating with that group that here's a new offense, here's new terminology. He's communicating that to the other guys. So everyone's on the same page. I think that's the biggest thing that started us obviously early on is, okay, we're communicating. We still got to get better, but we're communicating. We're all on the same page. So like I tell him, if all five of us screw up, we're right. Well, five of us go the wrong, in our, if someone else's mind the wrong way, we're all right. And that's usually what's going to work. But if one guy's going the other way, I mean, for us, offensive line, obviously, four guys can have the greatest blocks in the world. One screws up, we're all goats. So to me, we have to be communicating and work on the same page. John, have you ever been up against it like this, entering a season with an offensive line? And if so, yeah, like was what, what was the key to developing? It was probably 2016, 15, 16, somewhere the, the year that um, – I forget what year it was. The year we played in the Orange Bowl, I think 2015 was, I had lost three starters that went to the NFL, and then um, it was three of them, not four of them, but it was three of them that one ended up losing his job, but it was really four new starters. But to me, again, it was early on, we just keep it a little bit simpler for them. Um, and to me, the guys behind them got to accelerate. That's the young guys to me right now. It's not that it's the four new starters. I think it's just it's overall the, the number of young kids that are here. 
I mean, again, there's there's eight kids that are true freshmen, redshirt freshmen. So like the ones that the ones of seven or eight, I don't really, I'm not worried about. It's obviously something stupid happens and with injuries or things like that. That now you're going to guys that don't even have the experience of being here, don't have all that that any bit of experience, even practice of going through a season of practice, especially as the season goes on. That for high school kids coming in here, it's a long season. You know, this this year is going to be what three bye weeks. It's still it's a 16 week, 15 week season. That that's their bodies get kind of battered by that. You get start getting October. That that's where to me concerns me more in the end. But to me, right in the beginning, we're, as long as we stay healthy through camp, obviously we should be fine. And he's got to keep developing those young guys. So is the challenge more mental or physical? Both. I mean, because mentally, the good thing is four of them were here in the spring, so the mental part's kind of there. The mental part of the offense and knowing the offense. Now, the mental strain that's going to be on them is still the fundamentals and competing every down, uh, which I think going out of spring was high school kids didn't have to compete every down, every play of practice. Was they were always better than the kids in front of them in high school practice, that competing every play, not just, oh, I'm better than this kid naturally. No. And I think they learned that. So it's going to be the mental part of, the, of being physical for practicing games, and then just to me, the physical part of surviving the, the length of the season. It's just minimizing things. I mean, just not that you can't, you can game plan certain things, but it just to me is don't have as many plays, different schemes that we'll put in, which to me, we, we've, we've minimized that over the years. We've kind of started bringing that all down to where it's not a lot of schemes. Then, game plan wise, in the past, you might be, hey, let's put in these two different things. It's, I got to realize by Tuesday afternoon that it's too much, that we don't need it. Call this one that they understand. So that'll be the biggest thing for us is just minimizing as you get into the season some of the things that you might want to go overboard with that you've got to cut down and not run and say, you know what, live another day, but run the thing that we know. And if we know it, we'll be successful at it. You look at the end of the seasons all the time. The end of the season, you look at we ran this play three times. It was awful. We should have just call that play three more times. That's just for us evaluating and me being smart with Knowing what I, what my guys can do and can't do. Yeah, after talking about the number of years that you and Billy and Todd and the rest and Dan have worked together, because Dan says he can take advantage. He instinctively knows how to know what the other guy is thinking. What's that like? All those years of experience and coaching together. He says five of them can call him. Call him yeah, yeah. Because I, I guess I don't know what it's not like. <laughs> You know, again, in 25 years being at 19, been together in some form or some way is, I guess I don't know what it's, I mean, I do and I don't because there's new guys that come in the room offensively. You know, we haven't, we didn't lose anybody offensively this year. Um, so really to me, like Larry was the, Larry was the one guy coming in new to the system. Brian had played for us. Brian had been in the system. Billy, a couple of years when we were at Mississippi State, wasn't there, but had been together prior to that 14 years, 15 years now. And Coach Knock, Greg's been with us now 10, going on 11, I think it is. So it's in Brian, I mean, so it's, it's kind of one of those things. It's, it's weird that it's Larry, probably the hardest for those guys, is that we'll say, hey, you know, remember 2006, we did this. Oh, yeah. And four guys in the room will be, okay, and write it down and go on. And Larry's looking around going, well, I have no idea what they're talking about. And so you always had to remember to go back and tell them, listen, Larry, this is okay. <laughs> Get it on film and show them it so we see it. But I think it is. And the great thing about having, you know, defensively the same thing, David Turner's worked with us years on and off in Mississippi State. So you know him. But I think the biggest thing is for us offensively, we can go, hey, Todd, what, are they, what do you think of this? This is what we're going to try to do. Does this bother you? Todd can come over and say, hey, what do you, they're doing this. You know, why are they doing this? So you can always bounce things off both sides of the ball. But then on offense, it is. I mean, you say five guys, it's not. It's something you see, I see, Billy sees, Brian sees that, hey, there it goes, let's run this. You know, South Carolina, we ran the same play six times in a row. And at that, at that time, you'd say five guys called the same play. We ran the one play with the bunch formation to the right, we ran it, and five guys on the headset, do it again. We got, I think, 12 yards. Five guys on the headset, do it again. <laughs> so that was, at that point, five guys called the same exact play at the same exact time, because and you all, you get used to the offense, you know what our kids can do, and. You know, so anybody can. It's just, again, what you're seeing. And the good thing is there's no egos in terms of that's it. No, we're not doing that. You know, it might come up the next play, but here's something we got to look at. Hey, for the next series, this series, while we're in the middle of a series, you saw something, hey, hit it again, they can't adjust. 
you know, whether it's me, whether it's Billy, whether it's Brian, whether it's Greg, whether it's Larry, anybody. I mean, everyone's everyone's got enough experience to to know offense to say, hey, just do that again, or hey, let's run this. Hey, take a shot. Hey, let's run the reverse now. So there's all everyone sees something different, and on the game day, we're looking at different things. So there's things I'll see. Let's do it. And Brian's looking maybe more at the perimeter. Larry's looking at kind of the tight edge. You know, Billy's looking at the perimeter. That, hey, take that shot. We can beat the corner. They substituted a corner. Hey, the safety's out. Take a shot now. You know, we can win one on one with Van or Tyree or one of those deals. So it's 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 good to know each other. So you're not again, you're not caught up in each other. And there's the brotherly love. In terms of again, there's arguments, but that's that's part of the deal. I, I do because it, it helps me go back to, you know, even going through when we, you know, you start those meetings back in January, or February with the kids. There's things that, and then when you bring in four freshmen that are now high school kids that are walking the two deep, there's, again, like anything, you, you, you start assuming over the years when you have guys that come back. You know, the good thing is last year was the same thing. I got to teach everybody everything new. You know, as you start going on years and years, you start going, okay, those freshmen aren't going to worry about them because I have returning starters. So I start saying things like, kind of like you asked about our staff. You say something, those five, six, seven guys that have been in the room for two, three years, they already know what I'm talking about. And there's the two kids in the back, the freshman going, I have no idea what he's talking about. So for me, it's everything has to be. And again, for me, I have to teach the 15 different kids. And, and teaching and being a great teacher is, is there's 15 kids in my room that 15 kids learn differently. So however way I got to teach them, I got to teach one thing 15 different ways so they all get it. I have to do it that way. So even for us, I've been very repetitive through the off season of keep hitting the same things over and over again, but saying it maybe a different way so someone else gets it. And, and the biggest thing is for the kids to speak up when they don't understand it. You know, if you don't understand something, I'm saying if I'm talking Chinese to you, listen, you better ask. Because if you, don't, if you can't speak the language, and that's my biggest thing to start with is we're all in this room going to speak the same language. Not if you call it front, odd, okey, three down. It's the same thing, so we're all speaking the same language, so nobody's confused. How much, question, how much does having Miami as the opener heighten the sense of urgency for you guys, especially given it's front seven? I mean, that's where its real strength lies. Yeah, I think the biggest thing with, with playing Miami, like, having an opener, it's not, you're not usually, I mean, I say over the years, you, you play that first team that you're superior to physically. You know, so you can get away with maybe screwing something up. So I think just the attention to detail with the kids is getting on them early. And again, not to put them in a panic session any early on. We're still playing, whether it is August 24th, we're playing a game. So to me, we'll worry about the emotions come August 22nd, 23rd. But between now and August, that time, we got to get our jobs done and we got to be confident in what we're doing. Again, it goes back to with young guys, the biggest thing for them is be confident. Not playing stone, be confident. Brett, go back to from an, from playing a year to being injured, coming back. Okay, confidence in what you're doing. Chris Blythe, being confident in what you're doing. So it doesn't matter if it's Miami, if it's the Steelers, if it's whoever it might be. Jacksonville University, listen, be confident in what you're doing. We'll be successful. We've got to figure out what they do good, and we've got to be able to combat that. But first things first, let's take care of our business, and we'll worry about August 23rd, 20, you know, 24th, we play them. We'll, get, we'll worry about them, and we've got to play them. I guess. Go Gators. And I'll, we'll make sure we get you a mic. Camera's good in the back. All right, we'll open up for questions. Go ahead. Uh, Todd, so much talk about Jabari Zaniga, C.J. Henderson going into the season. What makes each of those guys special? Um, well, you start with C.J. You know, C.J. from a skill standpoint has the the size, the speed, the physical skill set to to play the tough routes, to play one on one, to be able to play and press, uh, make plays on the ball. Um, you know, you take that along with a guy that works his tail off. You know, you, you talk about a guy that's one of our hardest workers in the off season. Um, and then you go out to the practice, he's a guy that you'll see him stay after practice with Marco or Trey or, you know, the younger guys and not only work on his craft, but kind of 
work them a little bit too. So uh, he works at it. He's got a lot of passion for the game, and he can make plays. And then when you get with Zoo, you know, Zoo's the same way. Zoo's a guy that gives us a lot of flexibility in a sense with his size and speed. He's an effective guy on the edge as far as being a defensive end. But, you know, last year uh, he had four and a half sacks as an inside rusher. And he gives you flexibility, which this day and age with, you know, wanting to be multiple and play in situations and things like that, he gives you a lot of flexibility um, with his skill set to be able to try to match the situation at hand. What do you need to see from this defense during this camp in order to, like, feel good going into the opener? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is is you always start back with day one from the standpoint of, you know, we got to understand that there's a certain amount of relentless effort you got to have. Um, we're always going to talk about competitive toughness and, and you know, understanding that you have to compete every day. Uh, you've got to be able to handle situations. You know, this day and age, everybody works hard. Um, but it's really more about, you know, being able to take coaching, being able to take the, the pressure at hand and execute, being able to um, respond to adversity, being able to take all those challenges and go out and be productive. I think that's, that's real critical. And, and then the other thing is I always think that you kind of want to talk to them about, you know, stay above the line. And, and what I mean is, is like there are certain things that just kill you defensively. Um, you know, you miss tackles or you give up explosive plays. Uh, you don't play with the energy needed. So, and it's not, you know, this day of analytics, uh, you know, it's not really an analytics thing. It's like, hey, stay above the line. I mean, we need to play a certain way to be good. And when we get below the line, we create, we can create inconsistencies or give up things easy. I mean, you can play, you know, 10 plays great, but if you bust two and give up 14, you're not doing really good. So, you know, from a consistency standpoint, that's important. But really, to me, it's about uh, everybody coming in and understanding last year was last year. Um, it's time for this year. And I like the way our guys have taken ownership in the team. I like our work ethic. I like our confidence. But we've still got to go out and continue to execute. we got to develop guys that you know, a few positions and uh, put it all together. How, how big a jump do you usually see from year one to year two in running your system? And <clears throat> do you think that's applicable with this group, even yeah, despite I, roster turnover and things like that? Yeah, I mean, every year you're different, meaning, um, you know, last year, you know, we were new. Um, you know, we had a guy like Ja'Kai Polite. Um, you had Chauncey Gardner. Well, those guys are gone. Now we've added some freshmen. We've added Jonathan Gennard. Um, so you're always different. So I think the biggest thing as a coach, um, you're going to have certain core things you're always going to do, but you always want to play the strength of your players. So I think you've always got to be working to tweak what you do. And how do I get my best 11 players on the field? Uh, because at the end of the day, defense is about making plays on the ball. It's about handling blocks up front. It's about, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at it, um, don't let them run the ball, and how do we make the quarterback play bad? That's really what you try to do. So it's about beating blocks. It's about tackling the guy, you know, with the ball and being able to win your one-on-one -on -one matchups. So how do we win those one-on-one -on -one matchups? And that's the biggest thing. So, you know, we're going to change our personnel and our team every year relative to who we have. But you would hope that you would continue to improve as you move forward. How much uh, technical improvement have you seen both on film and since he got here from uh, Jonathan Grinnard from when you guys were together in Louisville? Yeah, I mean, um, he knew our system because he had been in it. So from a, a mental standpoint, that was more recall. It wasn't a big thing. Um, you know, from a technical standpoint, uh, he, had a, he had a decent foundation. And um, it was really just as guys continue to grow, it's about perfecting your craft. You know, that's what I always tell our guys is, you know, be an expert at your position. You know, it's, it's a craft. And that allows you to make, you know, plays. And, and it's like I tell our guys, you know, learning a position, learning creates opportunity. And the opportunity is, is to make plays. So as you develop and become an older guy like him, it's about honing in on your craft. So it was, it was not a hard adjustment, and he, he's done a good job. There were times on his tape uh, back in 2017 where he was playing a lot inside as well. Is that going to be factored in at all, or do you strictly seeing him outside? Buy a ticket. We'll see. A lot of people focus on polite for the pass rush you guys put together mm -hmm. last year, but yeah. Chauncey and, and Beauchamp were both pretty good as 
creative blitzers that you use. Do you have mm -hmm. guys that can kind of replicate some of that? Yes. Uh, coach, you had uh, Adam Schuler transfer in, becomes a starter for you. How have you seen him evolve? I know in high school he dealt with a lot of injuries, yeah. transferred high school. So what has made him such a great fit here and how he's kind of evolved as a player? I think he's a guy that's accepted the grind, meaning it's funny. If you go back and watch like scrimmage tape of last preseason, watch maybe the early games last year, he's really just trying to find himself because he basically came in and got rolling. So now – He's been with the best strength staff in the country and Coach Savage and his staff and what they do. He's been with them for a full year. And he's been in our program for a year, got to watch himself. He's a guy that works to improve his craft. Um, he was able to go into the offseason understanding, you know, these are the things I want to work on from spring practice standpoint and continue to develop himself at being a defensive lineman. So what you've got is more, a more seasoned, mature guy that uh, understands the system, understands what we're looking for, and has taken ownership in being a good player. And um, he's, he's just an older guy. He's more seasoned. So I think you'll see a lot of, a lot of uh, production from him this year. If I could ask you quickly about uh, Trey Dean as well. Mm -hmm. Have you seen him kind of be in the star yeah. position? Yeah, I mean, Trey is a guy that gives you a lot of flexibility in the sense that because of his size, he can play inside, meaning he can play nickel safety. Uh, because of his athletic ability, you know, he played at, he played corner last year. So what that does is it gives you the flexibility to move him around a little bit. And then my whole thing is, is how do you get your best players on the field? Well, with Marco coming back and the void left by Chauncey, it was who can move inside to get those three guys on the field at the same time. So talking to Trey about it and letting him understand, it really gives him more value moving forward. In his career, it gives our team um, an opportunity to get our best 11 on the field. And his skill set at that position is something that we'll, we'll cater to and allow him to make plays. And, uh, you know, looking forward to watching him play there, really. Right. Yeah, I think when you look, um, Kyrie Campbell up front, you know, David Reese is a guy. One of the reasons I was excited about Jonathan Gennard coming back is I knew that he had that kind of toughness. Uh, so those are guys. Um, I like the attitude of our team as a whole. Um, so to answer your question, you know, C.J. Henderson's a tough guy. Uh, Trey Dean's a tough guy. I mean, th th we have some t what I consider tough guys in the sense that they play the game the right way. Um, Zoo's a guy that, that can do that. So um, we, we have probably more this year than – not. I wouldn't say more. We've developed guys or guys have shown that kind of toughness as we move forward in the program this year. So I'm looking forward to those guys taking ownership in what we're doing and continue to play that way. Yeah, do you, do you see with Jonathan a little bit of a fire having to sit out almost all of last year and and having to wait for it and uh, pro excitement about getting to that yeah. play at this level? I think that um, the answer is yes in the sense of I think you have a fire and it's also humbling in the sense that this sport can be taken away from you at any time. Uh, don't take things for granted. Um, you know, he's got really good leadership qualities. He gives us position flexibility in the sense he can play buck or end. Um, so, um, I, I, and I think that the players see that, and I think he's – one of the reasons they excited me is, you know, you know, every room, every room has, like, for example, at our outside backer room, we have three new guys. And, um, you know, really, Moon was a guy that was the only guy that really had quality snaps last year in that room. Now you get three new guys like that, and then Jonathan comes in and has a work ethic that you – you like, and that can feed off into the young guys is, yeah, this is how to do it. So I always think it's critical that it's important to get those kind of guys in each room to kind of bring the young guys along. And uh, I think he's done a really good job with that. But I know he's excited to get going to play at this level and, um, you know, get back on the field and make plays. Is that part of why you wanted him here? Yeah.
because you know with, with the, the the grad you know the grad transfer thing and the transfers is is as you develop your team I've always thought it's important that you have guys just like we were talking about a minute ago with toughness like you have a guy in each room to make that room a quality room and as they move forward you know how what's the competitive toughness of that group you know and if that group can come along then it can bring another group along with it and then all of a sudden your team's that way and if you get away from that um, it can be death by inches in the sense of you know one guy's late and nothing and then all of a sudden you got two guys late so it's always good to get a guy that um, understands the value of accountability and can breed that into the young guys this is how we need to prepare each week this is how we need to work and he certainly does that yeah, David Reese is kind of a coach on the field, so to speak, and that's the nature of the position for mm -hmm. one. But is there anyone you see, younger players, kind of following those footsteps for the future? Because, you know, he'll be gone, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I think that when you look, uh, Steiner's a guy in the back end that, that has done a good job. Same thing with Sean. Um, those guys have tried to take ownership in the back end with what they do. Um, you know, Houston's a guy that's backing up David that – He's being told that to understand that, hey, you know, you, you kind of need to be understanding what the quarterback, what David's doing because, you know, you're, you're his backup or you're rotating with him uh, to give us that. But I'll be honest, like Ventrell Miller and Bernie, you know, they're in that same room. Um, and I, I've kind of seen a difference in, in those guys as far as encouragement or taking the bull by the horns a little bit and being a leader at times. And, um, and that's good. So I would see those guys there being that guy maybe when David's not around, you know, as we do rotations. Is there anyone who surprised you this offseason with his commitment and focus, or is that kind of a remains to be seen now? I think start? it's a little bit remains to be seen. The one guy that's really impressed me is Brunson. Um, he was a guy that, you know, I think it's always important that you listen to other coaches because Coach Knox is – so last year Brunson was a guy that – wasn't didn't get a lot of snaps on defense uh really didn't say a lot was kind of feeling his way both in our offseason program we first got here and through the spring and all that and as things move move sometimes you can get left but he kept working and grinding and you know he showed up in special teams which guys that play on special teams always indicate to me they can probably play on defense we got to continue to work with them and I think he's made the biggest jump since we've been here from being a guy that um, wasn't quite with it. I mean, and what I mean by with it is, is wasn't, wasn't maybe keeping up and kind of got left a little bit, but he kept working hard and he, he got into special teams and making plays. And now he's a part of our rotation with our inside backers. And he's a guy that we're going to count on to give us some snaps at some point this year. Uh, so that's probably a name that a lot of you haven't heard about that I'm excited to see what he can do in training camp because that would give us some snaps that have been left with Voshan, you know, leaving and that kind of thing. You know, we, I don't think we talked to you since the spring game. Mm -hmm. That was uh, probably a good thing. But yeah, yeah. Well, no, I mean, the deck obviously stacked against the defense that day. It's like batting time. practice. But, <laughs> okay, but, yeah, but do you take anything away from that, the safeties maybe? or? Oh, yeah. I mean, anything? you take away how do guys play. I mean, you know, how do they play individually? I think that, you know, spring games are a little bit like your scrimmages because you try to look at things, you try to get guys reps. So sometimes you're going to have guys playing with guys that may not play as quickly. And you can't look at the whole. you got to look at the individual and understand that how is this guy doing? Because when we put that together, that's when the whole needs to become complete. Um, sometimes in, in, in spring games and scrimmages, trying to get guys reps and matchups and those kind of things, you, you kind of got to be careful about looking at the hole sometimes because you're trying to, to work certain guys in and, and protect certain guys um, to make sure they're healthy for the season. So it's really about getting the individual's play, you know, get their play and how do they play their position. Yeah, uh, is there been any sort of tempering in bringing back Marco, or is he ready to head back out? He's ready to go. Up? Looking forward to watching him. I know he's chomping at the bit to get out there. He's really excited. He's worked extremely hard to get back. Uh, really excited to get him to be a part of our, you know, our secondary and our team. 
Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to him being out there. And with some of the departures this summer, where is your comfort level with that corner depth? Yeah, I mean, this time last year we were really in the same situation and Trey Dean came along. I mean, every year you're going to have to develop guys at certain positions. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the flexibility to play the best guys. So with the guys that have come in, um, you know, at corner this year, we're going to roll those guys, let them compete, and find ways to get them a part of what we're doing. And, um, you know, communicate with them as far as what they understand, what they know, and try to bring them along. But, you know, that's going to be every year anymore with the way college football is. You're always going to have young guys at certain positions, and you're going to have to develop them. So um, no one's going to feel sorry for us. So we've got to make the best of it and find ways to make it work. We'll do a few more. Nick, up front. Without using the next man up, how much of a loss was it to lose Marco so early last year? Yeah, I mean, you know, I always say that injury creates depth. And what I mean is that sometimes as a coach, like you, you we, we wouldn't have played Trey Dean as much last year as we did without the injury. But now what happens is, is when a guy goes down, it forces you to play somebody else. Then when that other player comes back, now you have more depth because it's forced you to play another guy. So in that, in that sense, um, Trey's a guy that's had a lot of snaps, we understand what he can do and the flexibility he has. We probably wouldn't have had that comfort level with him if not for the, the injury to Marco. So I think that I've always been a guy that injury creates depth. And the guy, when he gets back, it just allows you to have someone that has a few more snaps. How do you feel about your the interior of the defensive line, your defensive tackles? Do you like the depth and, and the experience you have there? Yeah, I mean, I think that we have guys in the sense of – you look at Shure and Kyrie that, um, that played last year. Um, outside of that, there's a lot of guys battling for snaps. I mean, we have the flexibility that, you know, with, with Conliffe and TJ and Dunlap, those guys were all in there last year. They're going to compete to see how they can do uh, and be a part of what we're doing. But also, you know, Zach Taylor and Luke are guys that have, have worked their strength, you know, have added a little bit of mass. Um, there's nothing that says they can't play in there either. So I think you're always looking to find ways to um, get your best players on the field. And if we've got to move someone in there, then we'll do it. And those two would be the best candidate to do that. Zach Carter, Zach Carter and Luke Ankrum, yeah. Will. Hey, Todd, you mentioned hey. uh, James Houston earlier. Mm -hmm. um, how much further along has he come from like last year in like the mental side of things and handling emotion? understanding the defense, that sort of stuff? I think a lot. I think that um, he's he's a guy that is way ahead of where he was last year. Um, the thing with him is he still has room to grow and develop. Um, and as long as he continues to take, you know, the, the coaching of, you know, David Reese ahead of him, showing him what to do, and Coach Robinson and myself, and, and understanding, you know, consistency in play is real critical. Um, he has the tools to be a really good player, and, and we're going to continue to work to develop that to get that out of him. Uh, but I like where he, what he's done in the offseason and look forward to seeing him you know, play this year and continue to improve because he's a good player. Right, we'll finish with Franz on the left. Uh, Todd, with, with all the changes, and almost, everybody is, almost everybody's running like 11 personnel now, and, uh -huh. and they're spreading the field different. How has that changed your philosophy? And, and as far as how does that change how you rotate people in and out? Because it, it, the game is always a constant change with personnel right. on the offensive side. Yeah, so it used to be when you started day one, you started with base, meaning you went with everything against two wide receiver sets. So you had your base package with, you know, your three, four and all that kind of stuff. Um, nowadays, with the three wide looks, you actually start with nickel as your base because you play that, you know, 85 to 90 percent of the time. So that's one change. And then the other change is, you know, we say we're three, four, we're a three, four defense. But in reality, we play as much four down as three down. So I think that gets into you want to be flexible and have ways to give different looks. You know, um, I think anytime you can get in and out of those looks, um, it's just a matter of trying to make the offense work. You know, uh, offenses are really good now. 
um, they got ways to create space for runners, um, you know, points go up and things like that. So how can we give them a little confusion to try to put them behind the sticks or to win a possession to give us the chance to get the lead? Because defensively, anytime you can play with the lead, it's a lot more fun and other teams become a little more predictable. So that that's probably the biggest changes is, is one, you start with nickel now. And then, you know, we're really a multiple defense. Just like we were talking about, we have ways that, you know, we can play four down or three down. We can play with multiple outside linebackers, play in other positions. We can play with multiple corners. And, and really trying to be multiple in what you do just to create a little bit of confusion in the offense. All right, thank you. Yep.